up for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about sustainable proteins to save the world. We have Paul Shapiro joining us on the show. Hello. Alan, what's going on? Nice to see you again. Super happy to have you back on. Paul was episode 14. Old school. Old school. Old school. Yeah, one of the first episodes that we did on, and at the time you had just published the book Clean Meat, and we were just unpacking the importance of it, and it was such, it's still one of my favorite books. I love it so much. It's very nice of you. You obviously don't read that much, but I'm <laughs> glad I made it into your top tier. It's such a good book. I highly recommend everyone check it out. And now Paul's revisiting after a whole year of advancing, starting the Better Meat Co, um, starting a podcast, getting married, all this cool stuff. So I'm very excited to unpack all this with you. So Paul Shapiro is CEO and co-founder of The Better Meat Co, and he's the author of Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. He's former VP at the Humane Society in the United States and currently co-hosts the Business for Good podcast. And you can find the links in the bio below to cleanmeatbook.com, bettermeat.co, and businessforgoodpodcast.com, as well as his Twitter. So check those out, everyone. Let's jump into things with one of our favorite questions to start things off, Paul. Let's do it. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Direction of the world. Okay. Well, if you are a human being, chances are that the world is better today than nearly at any time in the past. I'm a firm believer in what Steven Pinker is espousing, that it's a better time to be born than pretty much any time in the past. That uh, even uh, if you are not living in the so-called first world, that your life is still much better today than if you had been born, let's say, a few hundred years ago. Much uh, greater chance of you leading a, a decent life, at least. So. Uh, as far as humanity is concerned, I feel pretty good about where we are right now. However, if you are pretty much any other species on the planet, things have gotten a lot worse. And so I am one who believes that Homo sapiens are one animal on the planet among millions and that we are not the only animal on the planet who matters in the same way that we used to believe that the universe uh, revolved around us and then Copernicus and Galileo helped us to understand that we are not the center of the physical universe. Well, today many people believe and for most of human history people have believed that we are the center of the moral universe, right? That human beings are the only species that matters. And of course, there have been times when it wasn't all humans, it was one race or one religion or one gender or whatever. But now today, most people who you or I might be in social circles with would say humanity is what matters. That's the, the, the moral center of the universe. Um, whereas I think that other animals matter too. And we just haven't yet expanded our circle of moral concern out enough to actually account for that. And so while things have gotten indisputably better for human beings, they've gotten indisputably worse for other animals. Not just the animals who we are raising for food, whose lives have become ones of pretty much deprivation and misery, but also for wildlife who we are crowding out through our development, through our agriculture, through all types of ways that we are crowding them out and making it much more difficult for them to eke out an existence. And through climate change, which we are causing as well. So, uh, in fact, if you watch the really great new series, I think Our Planet on Netflix yes. with David Attenborough, it's a really great uh, look at the beauty of nature and how much we are doing to desecrate it. So, uh, the state of the world depends, in my view, where you find yourself, which species you find yourself, primarily speaking. Ooh, yeah, the hefty dose of humility there <laughs> is so good and so needed that we are part of a ecology that is much greater than just ourselves and just even the human race. Right, and in the past, people thought differently about this, right? Like in the past, they would not have said it was all humans. They would certainly not have thought foreigners. They probably wouldn't have thought about anybody who wasn't their race. Uh, they would have thought their group, their tribe, whatever their group was, they thought was the most important. And today, we generally say, well, all we don't act like it, of course, but we say all humans matter. Um, we, you know, uh, we do all types of things that favor our own in-group over other groups, but we at least say oftentimes that all humans are, are important, morally speaking. But there's a whole other world of, of animals out there, of species out there, and just because they aren't on the throne like we are, just because they aren't the dominant species on the planet like we are, it doesn't mean that they don't matter. Might doesn't make right in that sense. That, yeah, we are in control of all of them. I mean, we can wipe them out 
in a heartbeat, right? We can do anything we want to them. Other animals stand so powerless before us that we can do virtually anything that we want to them with nearly no repercussions most of the time. Yeah, every once in a while, animals will fight back and attack us, but it's very rare. Most of the time, we are obliterating their homes, we're obliterating them, we're confining them, we're enslaving them, we're doing all types of things that are uh, pretty unsavory. And we do it because we can get away with it, not because it's the right thing to do. So yeah, I, I am sad to say that I think the world is worse for most animals today than in the past, while better for us. Whoa, yeah, what a way to put it into perspective that our lives have gotten better in the meanwhile, we've made it harder for other species to, to yeah. thrive on the planet. Oh, the hefty dose of humility is so needed in the, in the direction towards this more sustainable ecology, which we actually talked about in a good amount of detail in the first time we sat down together on the episode when we talked a lot about clean meat. I want to spend a good chunk of time talking to you about what you've been doing the last 14 months. So the Better Meat Co. has started. You got married. You started the Business for Good podcast. Yes. So much good stuff. Things happen. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, so um, importantly, I did get married uh, to Tony Okamoto, who is a guest on your show. I don't know if that'll come up before or after this episode. It just came up before, yes. Oh, okay, yes. all, right. all right, well. Boom. Boom, <laughs> I, and she beat me to the punch. Uh, but yes, so I'm very, you know, Tony and I were together for uh, over two years and, and now are uh, actually married. And um, I know you and I last time talked about whether we thought that there was any life elsewhere in the universe. Um, and I have a great interest in astronomy. And so rather than getting the typical gold ring, I have a meteorite ring. So as you can see, this here is a, a, an actual meteorite that was cruising through our solar system for about 4 billion years before smashing into what is now Namibia. And it was found uh, a long time ago by indigenous people in Namibia who were using it for, this is a huge, I think it was something like 35,000 kilograms or something, it's a really big meteorite. And they were using it to make weapons and all types of things. And then colonists came and then they started, you know, they were like, hey, where do you, what, what rock is that? And they showed them. And so they started exporting parts of it. And now Namibia doesn't let you export any of it anymore. But what, what they did take, you can buy as jewelry and things like that. And so that's what this is. It's a part of the Gibeon meteorite that smashed into Namibia. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty You're wearing cool. a meteorite. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it is a wedding ring that is literally out of this world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I'll tell you, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, interesting. I didn't really know much about like the meteorite market, but it's surprisingly easy to get jewelry made out of these extraterrestrial objects. Um, and Whoa. these are, you know, the oldest rocks in you know, on the planet. Literally, these are the oldest rocks on the planet. Like, you know, they been four, formed four billion years ago yeah, or so. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that you're wearing it now out of this world. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. Yeah. And then um, you guys started the podcast, which I'm sure we'll get to as well. There's so much good stuff there with Business for Good. And then also the Better Meat Co. has started. So what has what are what is your thesis with the Better Meat Co. and these sustainable proteins? Sure. So there's a major problem with animal agriculture. It's inefficient. It's a leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions. It's a leading cause of deforestation and land use and antibiotic resistance, animal welfare concerns. The list goes on and on and on. Now, there's lots of different responses that you could have to this. Um, and in the same way that, let's say, fossil fuels are so problematic, you want lots of alternatives to them. You want wind, you want solar, you want geothermal, and so on. But in the same way that you want lots of alternatives to fossil fuels, you also want lots of alternatives to factory farms. Mm -hmm. So there are already companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods that are making plant-based meats. They take plants like peas and soy, and they turn them into foods that look and taste like animal meat. That's awesome. They're having uh, great success. I really admire what they're doing. Then you have companies that are making queen meat, which is real meat grown from animal cells. So they're not making alternatives or substitutes to meat. They're making actual animal meat that they're growing from animal cells. None of those companies have commercialized their products yet, but you know people do think that they'll probably do so within the next year or two, which would be quite amazing. It'd be amazing to have the ability to eat real meat slaughter-free. Now, that would be a big advancement when it happens, but 
it's still, you know, between the two of them, clean meat, which is 0% of the market, plant-based meat, which is still less than 1% of the market, you have about 99% plus of meat still coming from animals. Now think about that with regard to, let's say, milk. If you go to the milk aisle today in your supermarket, on average, 13% of that milk is plant-based. Soy, almond, coconut, mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, whereas less than 1% of the meat sold is coming from plants. So there's huge room for growth in this, uh, for both of them, but especially in the meat section. And cheeses are also starting to see probably less than 1% right now-ish. Yeah, that's right, for yeah. sure. But it is growing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is growing. And there's a, uh, there's a, a good joke about this um, that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Seth Tibbet, told it to me, which is, did you hear about the fire in the vegan cheese factory? The cheese still didn't melt, ha ha. (laughs) Right, but it's not really a good joke anymore because it's not true anymore. 10 years ago, the vegan cheese, of course, did not melt. Today, it does, uh, thanks to companies like Dea and others. So uh, things are changing in that respect. Now, what the Better Miko does is it takes a different approach. Rather than making plant-based meats or clean meats, we are formulating plant proteins in very specific ways that enables them to be used as an ingredient to put into meat itself. So we sell our plant-based proteins to meat users for them to blend into their ground meat so they can use a lot less meat. And I'll give you an example, Alan. So imagine the following scenario. Imagine that there is a corporate cafeteria, let's say in Cincinnati, and they are serving pork sausages. Now imagine that they decide that they're going to offer vegan sausages right next to the pork sausages. And by by some miracle, it's gonna be the same price. It's never happened, but let's just say by some miracle, it's the same exact price. Lunchtime comes, employees start filing in. What percentage of the people who would have purchased the pork sausage do you think are gonna switch purposefully to the vegan sausage? Yeah, I know. From your facial expression, it's not looking good, right? 10%? 10%? Sure. So that would be an amazing outcome. I mean, keep in mind, plant-based meat is still less than 1% of the total market. But sure, let's say it's 10%. That would be amazing. That would be fantastic. It would be the biggest success um, to uh, cause a 10% reduction in pork sausage and switching to vegan. Well, what we do is we enable that cafeteria to reduce their, consum- their selling of pork, but not by 10%, but let's say by 30 to 50% by blending our plant-based proteins directly into the sausage. And that way, nobody is even going to make a different decision. So the reality is that a small percentage of people are going to stop eating meat altogether. But most people are going to continue eating meat. And in fact, meat consumption in the U.S. is increasing right now. And it's increasing in places like China and India and Brazil that have the biggest populations. So if people are eating more meat today than ever before in all of human history, what ways can we actually cause a reduction that does not necessitate conscious consumer behavior change? Interesting. And that's what we're doing, is that we sell an ingredient that enables people using meat to use a lot less meat, and people uh, who are ordering that default product that nine out of 10 or plus people are gonna be consuming, they will get less meat with it. It's almost, um, it's, it's in some ways similar, not a perfect analogy, but it's in some ways similar to when somebody puts gas in their car. It's no longer all fossil fuels. A portion of it, maybe 15%, is blended with ethanol. And there's all types of debate about whether that's good or not. But, you know, it, it, is, it is that you are buying less oil, essentially. Mm-hmm. And you don't even think about it. You don't even contemplate that it's in there. You just do it. And the same is so with what we're doing, that people who do what most people do, which is to continue to buy meat, will simply get less meat as a result. Okay. So such an interesting way to... to, to put in uh, sustainable proteins into the existing meat consumption uh, economy. Yes. Um, and, and it's, a, it's okay, so let's, let's break this down. So uh, you make sustainable proteins yourselves with the Better Meat Co. Yeah. You sell those sustainable proteins to already meat producing companies, pork, chicken, beef, etc. That's right. And then they take your sustainable proteins and they blend them into the beef, let's say, that they already have, and then they're able to make their, that way they have more of the beef that they initially uh, started with. And then that, that amount, is, it's displayed. So if, if an original sausage, like a pork sausage in your cafeteria example, had uh, 100% pork in it, now it only has somewhere between 
30 to 70 percent. Sorry. Yeah, it'd be like 50, 50, 50 to, to, sorry, 50, 50 to, to 70 percent yeah. pork. That's right. So 30 to 50 percent is your uh, sustainable protein. Yeah. Okay, and that's how you decrease the amount of meat that we're consuming um, through making sustainable proteins and putting it into the existing meat economies. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so this has the effect of making the meat much more sustainable, but also uh, by, makes it healthier. So we're reducing saturated fat, reducing cholesterol, reducing total calories, all while making the better choice the easier choice. So that you want to make doing the right thing easier for people to do. You don't want to have to make them do something that they perceive as difficult. And in this case, it doesn't involve behavior change at all. They can simply buy what they've been buying, which is what most people do, and they will get a better product, better for the planet and better for them. Now, it doesn't displace the need for plant-based meats or for clean meat. It's totally. just another complementary strategy to actually, in the near term, help reduce demand for meat. And in the case that you were just mentioning on, on beef, it would mean that they would be able to use fewer cows. Yes. They wouldn't need to raise and kill as many cows because yes, they yes. would be blending this product in. And now, of course, when people hear about this, I mean, sometimes people start thinking about the F word, right? They're like, this is a filler. But indeed, this isn't a filler. This is something that enhances the product. It makes it actually better. By definition, a filler is something that's like a carbohydrate-based thing, like a breadcrumb or cellulose, that is just bulking it up while, without doing anything for nutrition. Our product is a protein base. So it roughly maintains the amount of protein in the product while at the same time helping them reduce saturated fat and cholesterol and total calories and making the product better in a whole host of other ways. So our product is certainly far from a filler. It's really an enhancer in that we help to make the meat better. And then the sustainable proteins that you were listing earlier, mm -hmm. um, there's uh, pea proteins, there's what are the bean proteins, there's um, soy proteins. Mm -hmm. So which ones is the... Sure. Yeah, so yeah, so um, if you think about, let's say the Impossible Burger, that's a soy protein base. Or if you think about the Beyond Burger, that's a pea protein base. We use... Um, in general, for different products, we might use wheat as a base for one, soy as a base for another, lentils or oats as a base for some others, lupin as a base for some. So there's a whole variety of plant proteins out there that you can use, and our food scientists and our microbiologists help to formulate products that meet that application. So it might be good in a chicken nugget, is gonna be different than a pork sausage, is gonna be different than a meatball, is different from a burger. And so we use a variety of these different plant proteins in various combinations in order to make a product that really enhances the taste and texture of the meat when people eat it. Okay, okay. And this makes sense, of course, the different um, sustainable proteins per each individual use case in meat. And then you, you started listing off how this is, um, we're, uh, we're using less meat, act, actual meat in this process, which is excellent. Um, at the same time, we, how, 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 how is it if we blend um, the pea proteins with the, um, or whatever the sustainable protein is with the meat, how do you, you were listing off some of the benefits. Do we feel as though these are good longitudinally for us to be able to consume them together? We think this is good. Yeah. So first and foremost, it does make it healthier. I mean, it really improves the nutritionals on the product, but it also has other benefits. So not just sustainability, but one poultry company did a, uh, focus group with their customers with our product. They serve them blind taste test their own products, which are 100% chicken minus the breading on the outside. And then they serve them blended. So uh, two thirds their product, one third our product. And what they found was that 60% of the consumers could not tell any difference at all. 30% mm. preferred the blended version and 10% preferred the solely meat version. So 90% of people said either no difference or actually is better. And imagine that, that you could cut down on the number of birds who are being confined and, and raised for food by a third with 90% with of people saying no difference or better. I mean, that'd be massive. You know, there's 9 billion chickens raised for food in the United States each year. Imagine if a third of them were displaced. Now, of course, this only works in a ground meat application. So imagine even if, if uh, half a billion could be replaced. Yeah. I mean, what a legacy to, uh, to help prevent half a billion birds from undergoing the type of uh, processes that are used in today's animal agribusiness sector. I would be very pleased to accomplish that. That's great that you had that taste test with such solid results too. 
And so it does seem then um, to make sense to want to add sustainable proteins into the existing meat mix uh, meat industry to make it so that we use less of the product, we slaughter less of the animals. Um, okay, okay. And then so the Better Meat Co. now is a bit over a year now of, 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 C of being CEO and co-founder of this. Um, you gave us the example of, of, of doing a um, uh, with the with the chicken comp with the just chicken company that's uh, that's adding sustainable protein, um, was that calf was that cafeteria example with the pork sausage is another one that's that's <laughs> the uh, serrano with the chicken um, yeah sorry. it came through that's great um, what 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 are the other um, I I industry yeah. examples where you're applied sure so we can go into burgers or hot dogs or sausages or meatballs or chicken nuggets uh, we work really well especially in dumplings and in a chili and in some of these you can use our product even at a hundred percent without really noticing any difference so no meat whatsoever but we think that there's a real benefit for companies that are serving meat to blend us in uh, because they can essentially add something that makes their product better in, in numerous ways and it's not going to appeal just to the vegetarians but rather the nine out of ten people who are going to continue eating meat and ordering meat can end up using those so if, imagine that you're a dumpling manufacturer and let's say you have a vegetable line of dumplings and a pork line and a beef line of dumplings probably around five or ten percent of your customers are buying the vegetable dumplings but quite closer to 90 percent are buying some type of a meat-based dumpling well it's important to have that vegetable based dumpling but imagine if you could replace half the meat in the other ones with our product I mean, you would have a far better advancement in terms of meat reduction than you would by having, you know, a doubling of the demand for the vegetable one. So that's what we help them do. And then how would I, as a dumpling manufacturer, do I just reach out to the Better Meat Co. and then yes. you guys like do an independent consultation with me, with your um, food scientists? And That's right. So what we yeah. would do is come to you and do a demo for you. We'd make a product for you that, let's say, was 50% of your meat and 50% of our meat and let you taste it and see what you think. And tasting is believing. You can do taste tests with your own staff, with your own customers, and check it out and see. You know, we're, on the, we're online at bettermeat.co. Get in touch with us, and we have products for beef. We have products to enhance pork, to enhance chicken, and so on. And uh, we would love to work with anybody who is interested in using more sustainable proteins. Whoa. Okay, cool. So then, like you said, taste things believing, so they can actually have the process of, of seeing um, these results as well. Okay. Um, Okay, another, another thought about this was that um, within, within this, um, this, these companies that are testing the, um, the, the alternatives of the sustainable proteins, uh, what is the approximate amount um, of, of saving that they're making that, yeah, teach us about that process too. Like, what is, you guys are manufacturing this in bulk right and then they're adding they're blending it yep okay and they're saving money because they're not using that additional cost in meat so there's a savings there yeah we aim to be cost competitive with the meat that we're displacing so on beef and pork it's easier for us to do that on chicken chicken at the commodity level is really cheap we do think that we can get there uh, but we aren't always necessarily cheaper on that front but on beef and pork it's easier for us to compete on cost but we are creating a product that makes their meat better. So even if they're gonna pay a little bit more in that case, we believe that the product is actually a better product and they, uh, they would be happy to do that. Now, of course, cost is oftentimes king along with taste and we have to bring our prices down uh, for, for those really inexpensive meats. And we are getting there. We really are making a lot of progress right now. And we're in fact scaling up by building a production facility in Woodland, California that will allow us to meet that goal. Okay, so the production facility is going up, it's scaling up um, to meet these goals of cost, taste. Then what do they have to label the product? Mm -hmm. Do they have to label the product and say that it has sustainable protein in it, or can they just say it's yeah. still? What well, you certainly it? have to include it on the ingredient list, but there are some standards of identity that USDA has. Uh, so for example, when it comes to a hamburger, you can't call it a hamburger if it has anything other than beef in it. 
Um, however, take as an example Sonic, the fast food chain. They make a blended burger that's 25% mushrooms, 75% beef. Mm. They can't call it a hamburger, so they call it the Sonic Slinger. It looks like a hamburger, it's on the burger menu, it's called a Sonic Slinger, nobody thinks twice about it. Interesting. So there are uh, ways to get around that type of a problem by not using the prohibited terminology, but for other products, uh, there aren't necessarily standards of identity at all, and so it's less of a concern. Uh, but the key is that as long as you're listing it on the ingredients as something, then it, you shouldn't have that concern. You shouldn't have any concern about it. And then so it would be like literally the packaging of that frozen um, chicken nugget would say that it has a pea protein as one of the ingredients. That's exactly right. And I think that this product works best as a stealth health product. So I'll give you an example. Many of the stealth can health. Yep. So a, a popular uh, phrase in the public health community, because if you think about it, I'll give you an example on canned soups. Uh, a lot of the canned soup manufacturers in recent years have been reducing their sodium count. People were very concerned about it. Michelle Obama was very concerned about it, for example. And so companies like Campbell's and others started reducing the amount of sodium very slowly in their canned soups, but they didn't put on the label less sodium, healthier, because people hear less sodium, they think it means less flavor, right? Ah. And so that actually depresses price, uh, not price, it depresses demand. And the same is so when you label foods low fat or less fat or whatever, people think less fat, they think less flavor. And so our product actually does enhance the flavor while reducing the total saturated fat, but it's not the best thing to advertise on because you lose people. You know, indulgence is what people want. They don't want restriction. Mm -hmm. And so for us to market this as a health product might appeal to some people, but for the everyday masses of meat eaters out there, it's not that appealing. So yeah, stealth health, I think is a better way to go. That's, a, that's such an interesting concept, a motto, phrase, stealth health. Yep. And yep. So, so, then, so then the, the uh, the packaging can actually say things that um, it can potentially say more flavor. It, it, yeah, okay. or, or you could say boosted with plant protein. People are really oh, into like people are really into plant protein these days boosted for good reason. With yeah. yeah, 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 that's what we're doing. I like that a lot. Boosted with, wow. Okay, and then the majority um, of the people that are working with you right now are, um, are, are manufacturers of large-scale meat. Yes, that, that's right, and restaurants. And individual restaurants can also yeah, work with you. Yeah, they'll purchase from us and add us, let's say, to their dumplings as an example. Okay, oh, okay, okay. And then the big cafeterias is also interesting because they have like, you know, th th tens of thousands yeah. sometimes of people that are eating there. Yeah, so we don't sell to them right now, but we would like to. Yeah, and I saw you like post about some of the like Cargill's making massive advances in, in yeah. clean meat and sustainable protein, so they could be an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We would be quite honored to work with them. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. It's good to it's good to know that we can, you know, push connections as they come up because I think that's a really good way to get to scale fast is through the corporate cafeterias as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the Better Meat Co. is so cool. I'm glad that you were able to break that down for us. And you've been spending uh, the last year plus on that. Um, let's talk about in the first time that we sat down together, we spent a lot of time unpacking clean meat. And just, you know, you've given, given us little um, bits and pieces throughout the conversation about the sustainability, the environment, the um, humanity with uh, the animals and their conscious. Um, so you've been kind of listing off these things. Um, I want to know in 2018, after we sat down together in March it was, there was a slew of funding that went to yeah. clean meat companies as well as 2019, this, this year as well, again, a massive amount of funding. So yeah. what's been the update in the last 14 months on the clean meat industry? Well, first, before we get there, I want to say, so yes. we did sit down to chat about it in March, but you may remember that we also got together at your home prior. Yes. And you gave me some really helpful feedback on a talk that I was going to give. Your TEDx talk, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I implemented uh, your suggestions. And you may remember that you thought that the beginning was too lengthy. It took me too long 
to get to the main like meat of the talk, so to speak. And uh, I agreed. And so I slashed a lot of it and, and cut it down. I kind of wish I would have slashed more, which you were still pressing me to do, but your feedback on it was very helpful and I implemented it and I'm grateful. And my only regret is that I didn't implement more of it back then. <laughs> uh, but it was a, it was a good talk and I'm, I'm glad. That was at South Lake Tahoe. It was good memory. Yeah, And yeah. you had the big uh, yeah, harpoon, harpoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on. So Paul brought a harpoon yeah, it's on a, stage. It's a real six foot long harpoon like an actual harpoon that had been used and it was beautiful when you told me this because then I realized how much emotional connection people were going to have to you bringing the harpoon out because people were using that for weight for killing whales for the oil right yeah yeah right the basic the blubber, prim- blubber. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah the basic premise is that you know we everyone used to have whale oil lamps at home and whaling was a taking a really serious toll on whale populations in the 19th century. Uh, there were even letters to the editor in newspapers back then from people pleading to save the whales. And these weren't modern day environmentalists. These are, uh, you know, 19th century pre-Civil War Americans writing letters to the editor pleading to spare the whales. Yeah. And uh, whales, though, eventually were not really liberated from harpoons by humane sentiment or by sustainability concerns. They were liberated because of the invention of kerosene. And we switched over pretty Mm. rapidly to a cleaner, more efficient, more affordable method of lighting our homes. And similarly, it may be so that farm animals, the animals who we can find on factory farms by the billions, may not be freed by humane sentiment or sustainability concerns, but it may be that there are technological advancements either in plant-based meat and or in clean meat that could render their exploitation as obsolete as a whaling ship is today. And so that's the point I was making with that uh, harpoon that maybe one day in the not too distant future, we may think of a slaughterhouse as archaic as we do a harpoon. We, may- we need to stay on this point just for another moment longer because we speak about this so much on the show about creating things that obsolete render the old stuff obsolete and yeah. update the new code and to go around trying to plead with people to make a change yeah. versus making something that is so much better yeah. than what the existing code is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like, we don't exploit carrier pigeons anymore, not because people cared about pigeons, but we had better ways to send our letters. Uh, We don't exploit horses in our city streets anymore, not because people necessarily felt bad for the horses, but because Henry Ford invented a much better way of transporting ourselves that rendered the exploitation of horses totally obsolete. Uh, In fact, really interestingly, I was reading an interview with Susan B. Anthony, the famed uh, women's rights advocate from the very last decade of her life, it was in the 1890s, and she asserted that she thought that the bicycle had done more to advance women's interests than the women's rights movement had. Whoa. And that's a pretty amazing statement to make. And the basic point was like in the 1880s, there there've been bicycles for decades for daredevils and circus acts and so on. But the so-called safety bicycle was invented in the 1880s and it gave women a way to get out of their house, to leave their house, to not be dependent on the men in their lives, to take them anywhere and enable them to organize, it enabled them to enter the workforce more easily and made them enable, it enabled them to basically lead less domestic lives. Wow. And so she thought like the bike, which you know, the inventor of the bike I'm sure did not intend for this consequence to happen in the same way Henry Ford didn't care about horses. Uh, but sometimes there are technological advancements that help to solve moral problems, that help solve social problems where their inventors couldn't have envisioned it. Now, it can work the other way too. Uh, You can have technologies that make matters much worse. For example, the cotton gin made slavery much more economically lucrative to the South. So, in fact, people argue that the cotton gin led to the Civil War because it made the South cling on to slavery much more when it was that much more economically important. So technology, it's like a knife. It can be used to, you know, cure somebody with a surgery or it can be used to stab somebody. Either way, technology can help exacerbate social problems or solve them. But uh, I believe that the problem of animal agriculture is not going to be solved without technology, without new types of food science advancements that are gonna enable us to continue to eat the foods that we love eating without having so many negative side effects with them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is one of the main um, theses in the book is that there's just so much 
uh, crazy that just ten, there's only tens of thousands of like lions and penguins, but there's billions of cows and chickens. Right. And this, like, and you were speaking about this earlier, like their lives did not get better. That's and right. Our lives did get better. Yeah. And we're going to obsolete the old code, the old mental maps of the world by making this, making clean meat cost less. Than, than slaughtering animals, as well as make it potentially even enhance um, us as well. So there's so many cool things with these like yeah, micro brew, uh, reactors, hmm. uh, bioreactors and stuff. But yeah, give us the, you know, in the last 14 months, yeah, what yeah. has like really been piquing your yeah. interest in the space? So when I published this book in January 2018, there were maybe about half a dozen co uh, companies in the world that existed to, to produce real meat without having to raise and slaughter animals. Now, there are about 30 of them. And before, there was very little investment, very little investment. Now, you have major investments. I mean, just, uh, this, just this week, the Israeli startup Aleph Farms announced that it raised 12 million US dollars, including from Cargo, one of the largest beef producers on the planet, invested in growing beef without cows. So when you have Tyson Foods investing in these companies and Cargo investing in them, and you're seeing tens of millions of dollars now going in, I and mean, even uh, Shiok Meats, the, one of the, uh, the first uh, clean meat company in Singapore, just announced that they raised 4.6 million dollars from their seed round just their seed round and you see that investors are getting increasingly hungry for these type of alternative proteins and there's a, a lot going into it of course again be realistic none of it not one ounce has ever been sold yeah. so you need to temper our expectations by saying like not only has it not been sold there's not one government on the planet that has allowed its sale yet even if they could compete on cost yeah. so there's still a long way to go but the potential is vast. I mean, I liken it in some ways to the, the digital photography revolution. Yeah. The very beginning, you know, for a long time, we only had photos that we printed out from gelatin film and you went into a dark room. And I mean, I actually remember, I remember when uh, I was like, I think in uh, early high school and one hour photo came out. And I was so psyched. <laughs> I was like, wow, I couldn't believe we were gonna get our photos within one hour. It's amazing, one hour. And now imagine if it took one minute. Imagine if your phone took one minute to give you your photo. I mean, Apple stock would go down the tubes if they took one minute to get your photo. I mean, even if it was two seconds, you'd be upset, actually. So, uh, you know, but back then it was really hard to imagine that. And yet it's the same thing. It's still a photograph, right? Like it's still a picture of what you press the button of, like that you captured something from life. And so functionally, it is pretty much the same thing, except it's just vastly better in innumerable ways. And that's why very few people even have cameras that use gelatin film anymore. There aren't that many one hour photoshops left around. Um, and similarly, we may come to think of the idea of raising animals for food and slaughtering them for food in the way that we think of gelatin film. That's the way we used to do it, but yes. now we have much better ways to get the same result. Uh, we can still have meat, still enjoy meat. It's just that you don't have to do all of the inconvenient things that you used to have to do to get it. And that's the promise of cellular agriculture, to be able to produce the same foods that we love with vastly fewer resources and fewer externalities. So you don't have all of the food safety problems, all the animal cruelty problems, all the greenhouse gas emissions, and so on and so on down the line, these problems that most people are familiar with now regarding animal agriculture. Yeah, this this the hedonic adaptation that you were just speaking about was very interesting. How we tr transitioned from having you know the dial up and the one hour phone uh, um, um, photo development to uh, we can't even take three seconds to let us something load. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it got we adapted crazily fast. The baseline increased, and so oh yeah, it's going to increase again with clean meat. You know, if we we say a lot on the show that fifty years down the line, the kids are going to be like, we can't believe you were slaughtering billions of animals. Yeah, on the plant on the planet. Um, I want you to speak about this. It used to be so in January two thousand eighteen. It was six companies. Um, and now in uh, May 2019, we're up to 30 companies. Yeah. And even Singapore, Shiok, 
um, yeah. meets in Singapore. Um, Al, what's the Israeli one again? Al- Al- Aleph. Aleph. Yeah. What is Aleph? Because Shiok is doing seafood as well, right? Yeah, so Shiok meets. Shiok. And Shiok in, uh, in Malaysia it means kind of like cool or fantastic. It's like street slang for cool or fantastic. Uh, Aleph farms. Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Al- okay. Aleph bet vet. So um, Aleph is, is the first letter in their alphabet, but they're primarily working on beef. On so, beef. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. So yeah. more more interest in this in this space. 12 million, you said? They just raised $12 million. Yeah, wow. it's pretty amazing. Wow, these in the seed round for shock was... Uh, uh, 4.6, 4. 6. yeah. Now keep yeah. in mind, at the same time, I mean, Impossible Foods this past week announced that they just raised another 300 million, bringing them to like three quarters of a billion dollars raised so far. So the plant-based meat space is vastly far ahead. Impossible raised $300 million recently? The, this past week, this yeah. This past week. Yeah, and that's on top of the 400 that they had already raised prior. Prior to that. Yeah. So they're valued at over a billion, two billion. Yeah, two, dollars. I think, two is where they're at dollars. right now. Yeah. And do we know how much they move in possible um, foods, burgers? Do we know how many they move every single uh, like month or... Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know uh, if they've publicized that, but they did just announce a joint partnership with uh, Burger King. So, that was huge. Yeah, the so, Whopper. Yeah, the so, Impossible uh, Whopper. Yeah, you know, I was actually in St. Louis on a layover the other day, and I said, which is the first city that they rolled it out in. And I really wanted to leave the airport to go try it. And I was like weighing the chance to like be a part of history, you know, trying the Impossible Whopper in the very first city that it rolled out in versus the hassle of like leaving the airport (laughs) and then going back through security and possibly missing my flight and all this and so i didn't do it which uh, i i now kind of regret because my flight got delayed and so i could have made it definitely but uh anyway i do look forward to it Um, i have enjoyed greatly going to carl's jr and getting the beyond burger from there which is quite phenomenal So beyond burgers and carl's jr rolled on carl's jr impossible foods rolled out in in a Burger King. Yeah. Um, I want you to speak to this. I think this is very important. How the- much are these uh, yes. burgers? Let's do the cost. My understanding uh, is that the Impossible Burger will cost $1 more than the Whopper. Then the, the Impossible Whopper will be $1 more than a conventional Whopper. And that's for now. Yes, and, for yeah, now. That's pretty good to have yeah. it just be $1 more. That's Trust fantastic. Me. Scientists, yeah. wow. Yes, I, yeah. you know, there is a, uh, a funny thought uh, where, um, you know, you oftentimes see, like, uh, especially here in San Francisco, you see bumper stickers, no farms, no food. Uh, well, considering how integral scientists have become in feeding us, I think we should make bumper stickers say, no scientists, no food. No scientists, <laughs> no food. That's a good one. You know, I mean, yeah. that's the truth. That is the truth. It's not that the other one isn't also true, but it is, it's just also true that we should be grateful for scientists. I think another one of the images that's really good for this is when you see the person that was, that's, that's juggling uh, plates on the stage in front of thousands of people. Um, and then what you don't see is all the steps leading up to the stage where there's all the broken plates. Oh, and so, wow. And, and so yeah. then that's very true for basically anything that people build as artists or entrepreneurs or scientists. And like yeah. um, what's currently being done, oh, it's only a dollar more? Wow. And soon <laughs> it'll be equivalent and then less. And, yeah. and then the taste will be completely indistinguishable. Um, I want you to speak to this quick. These timelines. Okay, the investment that it, the investments that are being made in clean meat companies is just this is still the nascent period. That's so true. So please get your friends, your families, your coworkers, social media, get people involved with wanting to put in money. Apparently, Indie Bio thinks this is a hundred trillion dollar opportunity in the wow. next couple of um, of the next century is going to be just a hundred. The bio econ, the bio mm-hmm. opportunities are massive, but agriculture and food specifically is like multi trillion. So you can get in early still today by yeah. putting money in and so oh me- it's so early it's so early i mean 12 million dollars it sounds a lot to mere mortals like us but in the world of the meat business it's it's nothing it's a tiny little sliver i mean what's really needed to make clean meat something that is scalable and is going to be cost competitive is orders of magnitude more than that and they're, the companies that are going to succeed might not even exist yet. Like you could be yeah. the early investor in the one that's actually going to succeed. Um, I mean, look at just, there's so many examples of this from looking at like, uh, uh, well, anyway, there's lots, of, there's lots of examples of companies that were not the first to market, but which ended up becoming the, the, the market leaders. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but point is there are, 
so many opportunities to get involved in this space. Queen meat is just one. There's also queen leather companies, eggs, milk. Uh, there's companies that are making even spider silk out through, uh, through acellular agriculture. Uh, there's companies doing plant-based meats, plant-based seafood, meat, meat enhancement, like what Better Meat Co. is mm -hmm. doing. So there's a whole range of opportunities to try to use business to solve these problems. The reality is, is that the governments of the world so far have not come close to solving the most pressing problem that we face, which is how we feed ourselves sustainably because it's at the root of our public health crises, our climate change crisis, um, yeah. food insecurity, like the world is only getting uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, when we think about humanity increasing our numbers, you know, we're at 7.8 billion people today, but by 2050, it's gonna be closer to 10 billion people. The planet's not getting any bigger. Uh, our footprint on it is getting bigger. We're not gonna be farming Mars. We're not gonna be farming the moon. We only have this planet. And while I hope we do eventually get to Mars, the bottleneck is now here. Yeah. And if we don't get extremely more efficient about how we feed ourselves, we're not gonna even have a choice, uh, uh, excuse me, we're not gonna have a chance to be able to do things like colonize other celestial bodies. So we, we won't survive ourselves. And so because the governments have not implemented policies that are gonna solve this, businesses are now taking up the mantle and they are creating solutions like the kind yes. that are described in this book, like the type of solutions we've been talking about during this chat. Yes, yes. The, the, another critical piece to this is that you're describing, you know, uh, companies like Microworks doing mycelium production for leathers, for structural materials. There's so many interesting ways, of course, um, uh, egg whites and, um, and uh, other dairy products, cheeses and whatnot. So there's, there's, this is now um, taking foot in the clothes that we wear. How can they be made? What, what, what does biology know that we don't know? What are the billions of years of evolution of mm. things like mycelium and, and bacteria? How can they be potentially even genetically engineered to do things like sequester carbon or, or eat plastics? There's all different yeah. kinds of crazy things. You know, I was just reading an article. It's so interesting you mentioned this, Alan. I was just reading an article the other day about how there's not one but two fungal species that we know can digest plastic, which is incredible to me because think about it, people say, well, plastic isn't biodegradable. We have thousands and thousands, I mean, billions of tons probably of plastic out there in the environment and we don't know what to do with it. And we keep producing more of it. Well, we need to stop producing non-biodegradable plastic, but what if we could, let's say, create, let's say there's somebody out there, here's a company idea for you. Start a company that uses these species of fungus to ferment uh, plastics and actually biodegrade them yeah. and create maybe something usable, like some soil or maybe, I don't know what they excrete once Correct. they digest this it, is, but- these are questions, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I am not a mycologist, but if you could use certain fungal species to actually, um, or if, if presuming that what they use to, uh, presuming what they use to digest it as an enzyme, you could find a way to synthesize that particular enzyme and then mass produce it and get rid of this plastic. Uh, you, know, create, you know, create contracts with municipalities to take their plastic from them, digest it, and break it down and have, make something useful out of it. In the same way that there are carbon capture companies now that are trying to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and sell it for biofuels or for other uh, things that actually are useful for the world, um, why not make plastic be useful as well? Our ignorance, we need a hefty dose of humility because then yeah. we can actually get to these solutions more effectively. We can tap into the understanding yeah. of biology to, to tackle these things. Yeah, I, I often say that the only thing that exceeds our arrogance is our ignorance. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, because we believe ourselves to be so smart. In fact, we call ourselves homo sapiens, which means you know the wise human, right? And of course, that's what we call ourselves. That's not what was just ordained to be called. We believe yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's our own arrogance, really. And actually, you know, it reminds me of a quote from Darwin. Uh, it's a paraphrase, sadly, I don't have it exact, but he said, um, uh, it's something like, um, ignorance instills confidence more than knowledge does. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, which is true. Like yeah, when yeah. ignorance instills confidence, but the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. You don't know. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 So yeah. The look only thing look, I know is I know nothing. Yes. Yeah, the yeah. great paradox. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, so anyway, look up the quote. It's like ignorant, nothing instills yes, it's, ignorance. Uh, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little and not those who know much who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by oh, science. Oh, vastly more profound than my paraphrase, uh, obviously. Thanks for, thanks for pulling yeah. that up, yeah, Remy. No, I didn't pull it up. I, I knew it by heart. <laughs> <laughs> of course. What, what an erudite man. <laughs> Were you just talking about arrogance and ignorance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah right. Sorry. Um, okay, just a couple thoughts on the way out. I want to I wanna get your take on this quick. Um, you, you and Tony started the Business for Good podcast. Um, you are, you've been mentioning it so much throughout this conversation that we're tackling some of the biggest challenges. We're prioritizing um, ecology. We're prioritizing solving these challenges. And so teach us about these guests that you've been having every two weeks on the Business for Good podcast, why you did it. Yeah, sure. So the purpose of this podcast is to spotlight companies that are using the power of commerce to make the world a better place. Uh, I really believe that many of the most pressing challenges that we face as a species will be solved by innovation and through technological advancements oftentimes. And so we interview uh, titans of industry and uh, small scale entrepreneurs who are starting companies to try to solve real pressing problems. Sure, these folks would like to make money, but that's not the purpose of what they're doing. Yes. You know, John Mackey, who was a guest of ours, the CEO of Whole Foods, has a really great analogy where he talks about how if your body makes red blood cells. If you don't make red blood cells, you will die. But that's not the purpose. Your purpose of your body is not to make red blood cells. It's the purpose for your body to do whatever you deem it is. Whatever meaning you give your life, that's your purpose. That's what you're going to pursue. Well, the same is so with a business. Businesses have to make money. Without making money, they will die. But that's not the purpose of the business. Businesses that are truly conscious about their purpose know that making money is not their ultimate aim. It's a, certainly an important part of what they do. It's a side effect of what they do. But they're trying to, for example, make organize all of the world's information for us, mm -hmm. like Google, or promote public health, like John Mackey would say that Whole Foods is doing, or be the most consumer-friendly company on the face of the planet, like Amazon says, right? So they have their own purpose. Well, think about then a purpose like, um, uh, like Lindgrove, which is a company here in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, Joe shout La out, Joe. Yeah. yeah, shout out to Joe, who is on our podcast. Uh, they are making tree-free wood. They're making products that act like wood and making guitars out of them and so on that don't involve cutting down trees. Chairs too. Yeah, Crazy. yeah, I sat in their chair, it was really Likewise, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty awesome. I would like to have one of those chairs. What a status symbol, it's like the Tesla of chairs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, tr this wooden chair was made without wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. Um, it's a cool story. Um, or if you think about people like Shiok Meats, like um, Sandhya, who we had on the podcast, she's a, a PhD uh, biologist who is now making shrimp without having to raise shrimp. She's actually growing shrimp, sh shrimp cells. Uh, and there's many other companies. So Appeal Sciences is another one, A-P-E-E-L, or A-P-E-E-L, Appeal, mm -hmm. where they have created an, an organic, uh, basically a, a, a film that goes on top of produce that makes it uh, last for twice as long. Whoa. And so think about how that can affect food waste if your produce lasted twice as long as it does. And really coolly, it actually um, makes it not just last longer, but be ripe longer. So if you think about like an avocado, where the avocado, like the period, the window of ripeness, is like that, you know, yeah. like you miss it, you're done, you're yeah. a goner. Uh, whereas they double the length of the ripe window as well so that it lasts longer and it makes it, it makes it better. So, yeah, so we should, I mean, if, if all of avocados were, had appeal applied to them, like think about what a great world that would be. It would be a much better world. Um, so that was a, another example of a company or we had on, um, um, Prince Khalid, who is a Saudi Arabian prince, and he's a venture capitalist who invests in clean energy and alternative proteins. We had on um, a McDonald's vice president to talk about their decisions from when in like the 19, I think it, I think it was the 19, <laughs> bless you. It was in the 1980s and they got rid of styrofoam in favor of uh, plastic, or excuse me, in favor of paper, or with some of their other sustainability initiatives they've done. 
We had on uh, Seth Goldman, the CEO of Honest Tea, yep. who wanted to try to create less sweet products to reduce the number of sugar calories in Americans' diets, ended up selling it to Cook, and now you know they're in the Happy Meal. I mean, it's incredible. Boom. That, yeah, it's like, and he's now the executive chairman of Beyond Meat, interestingly enough. Whoa. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, we have on the folks who have been really successful business people and people who are just, you know, real uh, nascent entry into the business world who are trying to create new products and new companies that can solve pressing problems. And so that's the whole premise of the show. And it's a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And yeah. uh, I've heard from a number of people who have either joined startups or have, or have started their own companies now because they've been inspired by listening who have said, yeah, I want to start a company. I hope that somebody, we're talking about this fungal company for plastic. I hope that somebody would do that. I hope somebody takes that Likewise. idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you've started the show because now you get that what you just said there about you get to sit down with these leaders and yeah. these conversations that are then recorded and get to inspire and engage other people and you're like damn this is fun stuff you get to learn yeah, a lot you I'm know? learning so much from it I really do and it, you know there's my knowledge prior to doing it was largely in the food space but we've interviewed a lot of people who are doing really cool things uh, outside of food that are really doing uh, tremendous things to solve problems uh, one of my favorite interviews actually was a guy um, uh, Father Greg Boyle, who is a priest yeah. down in LA, and he thought that gang members had really bad lives and he wanted to find ways to help them re enter society. So he started Homeboy Industries and he created all these businesses that just hire like ex offenders and he gets jobs for people. He creates businesses for the purpose of hiring ex offenders to give them a way out of the gang life. Awesome. And you know, what a great thing. I mean, everybody deserves second chances. Totally. You know, even people who have murdered somebody, if they come out and they want to re-enter society, we should let them re-enter and, you know, be actually a positive role in society, right. have a productive job and bake bread for somebody. That's one of their companies is the Homeboy Bakeries. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a big, uh, I'm a big fan of what he is doing by giving people second chances. I love it, and I love listening to to the podcast. Definitely go check it out, everyone. Business for Good. Dot Business for Good Podcast dot com. com. Yeah, is the full link. Business for Good Podcast dot com, and then um, let's ask the couple quick questions on the way out. All right. Okay. We we have. I'm pretty sure we asked at least a couple of these the first time we sat down together. It'll be interesting to see if you've changed yeah. your thoughts on the answers. Yeah. Maybe um, new evidence has arisen that maybe, has forced yeah. me to reconsider. Yeah. Yeah. What is the new evidence on the first one? Are we alone in the cosmos? You know, I'm, I'm distressed that it's becoming increasingly in vogue to think that we might be alone. I think that since the last time that we talked, there have been, there's a study on the Drake equation that was suggesting, well, actually, it looks like we may be more likely to be alone. It looks like there might actually be like a great filter that prevents life. And I am not sold on this. And a lot of smart people are, but I think that every time Homo sapiens have believed that we are special. We have been knocked off of our throne. We thought we were the only animal that used tools. We thought we were the only animal with language. We thought we were the only animal with a set of morality or ethics. And all these things have been disproven. And I just am, I think it's totally hubristic to declare that we are alone. It's a vast universe. Vast. And life, the, the the elements of life, the things that make up life, are in widespread abundance throughout life, throughout the universe. And we know that even in our own solar system, on Europa, on Enceladus, there are massive liquid water oceans right now that have been there for billions of years. So maybe these liquid water oceans have been around for billions of years and don't have life in them. Possible, but I wouldn't mind going and checking it out, going in and seeing. I have a friend, Brian Ottens, who is working at NASA on uh, these type of missions to figure out like, how could we actually go to Europa and see? Because it's like, you know, a number of kilometers down is where the session is, because it's all ice on the mm -hmm, outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard to get there. It's not like you can, you know, cut a hole and, and go down. You have to drill a huge distance. Enceladus has the plumes that we yes. can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Cassini actually captured some of the plumes that came out of Enceladus. But the good news is that the ice on both Enceladus and on Europa is moving around and sometimes it breaks and you can look 
on them and see photographs of them that, that our probes have taken and see that like lines where they've broken and then shifted. And so if you could land and go to somewhere where near where it breaks, you know, drop a camera down there mm -hmm. and see uh, see if you find any fish down there. Boom. Yeah, that would Just be like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of something that would have a bigger impact on how we see ourselves. Exactly. And how uh, humble we become from that. Yeah. yeah, I hope that's true. I mean, it's, you know, human arrogance is a, a persistent uh, feature of our operating system, it seems. But I would like to believe that if we knew that we were not as special as we think that we are, that there is life elsewhere, that maybe we would come to recognize a humbler place in the cosmos for ourselves and not think of ourselves as tyrants and dominators of everything that's around us, but maybe we would say, huh, maybe, for example, that the other animals here on this planet don't exist merely for us, but rather exist with us. Yeah. Maybe our brethren who are existing on Enceladus, should they exist, are also just living here in the cosmos with us. None of us asked to be born. We arose without any consent on our part, and yet here we are. Maybe. And that might be true. Uh, maybe. We, maybe. We don't, yeah, we don't know if we came from somewhere beyond playground Earth to come into these Earth suits, potentially. Yeah. I'm open to that possibility. I really am. But we don't know. And I think it's important to have a sense of humility about ourselves and to remember that we are these frail, fallible, little like hairless apes and we have momentarily risen to be the dominant species on our planet for the time being let us not get drunk on our own power let us not think that we somehow are some uh, you know fallen angel we are just a risen ape and the reality for us is that the better understanding of our humble place in the cosmos that we can assume, I, I think the better off it is not just for our fellow creatures on this planet, but for ourselves as well, because that type of an attitude that places you on the throne and everyone else at your feet yeah. is a corrupting attitude. Totally, totally. Well said. The next question is, are we in a simulation? Mm, the evidence gets better. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, so... Uh, lots of people who, are, who have thought about it more than I have and who are smarter than I am believe so. They believe it's like 99% likelihood, right? So I'm willing to accept that it's true. However, it changes nothing about what I would do with my life. So the suffering here is still real. I believe that even if we're in a simulation, um, it is still bad for you to get sick. It is still bad for me to cut your arm off. It is still bad for you, know, you to uh, you know, lose a loved one. That the suffering is still real. And my goal in life is to reduce as much suffering as I can. I want to promote happiness and reduce suffering. Those are the metrics by which I measure the, the worth of my life, really. And simulation or not, I believe that suffering is real and I believe that we should reduce as much of it as possible. You're gonna keep leveling up and achieving your goals, but it very much so could be that we are in a simulation. Oh, I, yeah, I'm very open to that possibility yes, yes. That, that we are in some type of either like an ancestor simulation sure, sure. Or, or something along that line. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, who knows? I don't, I don't have any idea, but I'm willing to accept that it's true and I'm willing to say it will change nothing. It's kind of like free will. I, I think logically speaking, it seems unlikely that we have it, right? It just, I just, I can't imagine how it could be true. Um, but it still doesn't change anything. I'm not gonna sit in bed and think, oh, I couldn't have helped but to sit in bed all day. I'm going to get up and try to make the world a better place. So maybe I couldn't have helped but to have done that. I don't know, maybe my psychology led me to do that. But I believe that free will or no free will, I will act the same way no matter what. And then our last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, your last interviewee, Tony Okamoto, obviously. <laughs> Teach uh, us more, tell us more. Uh, so yes, I love my wife and I'm very thrilled uh, to be her husband. I do think that she's beautiful. But uh, for me, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, what, when I think of beauty in the world, I think of those who have power that are using their power to help those who are less fortunate than they are. Mm. And so when I see, for example, a soldier in a war zone who is giving water to a stray dog 
or when I see somebody in, uh, for example, Africa who is using their career to help protect animals from being poached. I mean, that speaks volumes about humanity's capacity for good in the world. It's not solely that we are committing all this callous cruelty and, and doing horrible things, but that we can also display enormous compassion and enormous kindness. And we can lead very selfless lives uh, devoted to the service of others, especially those who are, are less fortunate. And so it doesn't need to just be animals. It, it can be human beings. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I think that's wonderful for people who devote their lives to helping those uh, humans who are less fortunate too. But to me, seeing those who have power and could use it for selfish purposes, but instead are using it for selfless purposes, that's real beauty. Mm, that's a great one. Thank you so much, Paul. Dude, thank you, Alan. This has been such a pleasure. Man. Yeah, thank it is you. my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've had such a good conversation for round two. I've really enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it's a fun time. Super fun, super fun. I want everyone to check out this, you know, to have more conversations, sustainable proteins to save the world. Thank you very much for tuning in and talk to more people about this. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Also, go check out the links below, thecleanmeatbook.com. Read that book, share it with other people. Also, Better Meat Co. Start talking to more people about that, the Business for Good podcast com as well as Paul's Twitter. Check out those links below. Talk to more people about the clean meat revolution. Talk to more people about it. Go share it. Huge shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ron. And support the artists, entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Help us scale our impact and keep growing as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love you very much. We'll see you soon. Peace.